sorry, saying for office hours, you don't have to email or anything ahead of time to come. You can just drop in whenever you have questions. Uh, I think the schedule is just about ready to post if it hasn't gone out yet for the Learning Resource Center. There's a few changes this year from the past way we've done our office hours. We have one room in uh, 170 Celeste, it's a big room uh, where TAs hold their office hours. We're also going to be having lab office hours with like lab TAs on the second floor of uh, Celeste as another place where you can get lab questions answered, um, hopefully efficiently throughout the semester. And there's even going to be some evening Zoom office hours um, by some TAs if you have questions in the evening that you can drop into a Zoom session. We'll get that information sent out if it's not already out through an announcement. I did see a blank announcement. I have no idea what that was about. I'm sure you guys got that too. Um, I think somebody meant to put something into that message and either forgot. So um, the lab might be sending you an announcement later today with whatever that was about. Um, and then one thing I wanted to mention about mastering chemistry and grade syncing is that uh, so some of you guys have wondered how you submit reading assignments. Th those assignments aren't graded in terms of the reading assignments. So those are just there for you to see what sections are going to be covered so that you can also be linked into the e-text so you can have easy access to try to read through the material um, that's kind of associated around that particular lecture. These might be useful before a lecture for you, maybe a quick skim, maybe after lecture for more deep read. Depending on how well you remember some topics from high school, you might be skimming mostly. When you get to topics that are harder, uh, um, where you need to read a little bit more thoroughly, maybe those are the ones you're spending more time reading. Probably after class with the more thorough read than before class would be my, my guess for most of you guys. Um, and then the pre-lecture assignments are the ones that are graded for part of the course. The first one of those is due before Monday's class. I think everybody should see due dates for these assignments in Carmen um, that they've been synced, and so you should be able to see those in your Carmen uh, um, calendar. The uh, other thing I want to mention is lectures. Um, I'm recording today's lecture to my iPad. I later uploaded to YouTube. Um, if you missed the first lecture, it's up there. If there's something in class you want to see again, um, you'll be able to watch lecture videos throughout the uh, semester. I also put the video of the balloon exploding. I just wanted to point out, it got like 1,300 views somehow on YouTube Shorts. I don't even know what a YouTube Short is, but when I uploaded it for a short clip, it went as a short. So I kind of felt bad for people scrolling through their phones, like wasting time coming across that video, because it's literally just me going, I'm blowing the balloon up without much setup, so I don't know. Anyway, we'll get into uh, chapter one here. Um, some of the topics, we were getting into some of this um, sort of terminology when we were looking at that reaction where we blew up that balloon last time. If you recall, we had the reaction H2 for hydrogen, O2, the molecular form of oxygen reacting to form water. Now, let's make sure we're, we're sort of on the same page with some terminology. So our atom is our basic building block of matter. You know, it's like the, the smallest um, piece of a particular element that you can have is one single atom. Of course, later in chapter two, we'll see the atom is comprised of subatomic particles, uh, but the atom itself is our building block of matter. Um, we get our atomic view and we start thinking of things like one hydrogen atom bonding with one other hydrogen atom. And then when we start thinking of an oxygen atom, oxygen atom, and then replacing um, those elemental forms of, of hydrogen and oxygen with water. We're just rearranging those atoms when we do chemical reactions, which we'll talk more about in chapter three. Um, obviously, our periodic table is important for chemistry. Um, the thing I wanted to mention here for the elements is that um, obviously there's a lot of elements. We don't have to memorize the layout of the periodic table. If you need a periodic table on quizzes, or well, there's really no quizzes, but if you need a periodic table on exams, you get one. Um, you usually get the symbol, not necessarily the name. So the only thing that you might have to connect with is if we say something like, you know, you have like five grams of sodium and you need to do a calculation once we get into atomic weights and all that stuff, um, you may just have to know Na is sodium. You may not know that right now or you may have forgotten that. But the thing that you may want to make sure that you understand are the name to symbol or symbol to name connections, which for most elements isn't all that hard for like, you know, chlorine Cl or something like that. But for, for sodium being Na or potassium being K, those are the ones you just may want to make sure that you go through um, the more common elements. So roughly the first four rows of the periodic table, and then a couple groups are more maybe common in examples than others, like the halogen group, the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine group. Um, but those are pretty straightforward. The halogen group um, is one that we tend to use in examples a fair bit more. So you'll see um, you know, elements often with their name. You'll just have to make sure you know what symbol to look for if you need to look something up on a periodic table. And so compounds are where we have two or more elements present within the formula.
So something like H2O is you know, an example of a compound. Something like H2 or something like O2 would not be a compound because they just contain one element. So something like O2 would not be a compound because it only has one element present. O2, we could call that a molecule. We were talking about this last time that we could look at H2 or O2 and call them molecules, that they exist as molecules compared to maybe something like helium. Our noble gas group of elements, helium, neon, argon, those exist as monoatomic, one single atom uh, gases as their standard form at room temperature. So if we had like a sample of helium, we'd have just individual atoms of helium making up that sample without them bonding together, like in the case of hydrogen. So H2, this would be a molecule. Helium would be an atom. Water we could call a molecule or a compound or a molecular compound. Some of the things that we differentiate in chapter one are chemical versus physical reactions. A chemical reaction is where we have a change in the formulas of the substances throughout the course of the reaction. So it's where we're changing the form of elements in the compounds or compounds into other compounds. Um, so an example of a chemical reaction might be that H2 plus O2 reaction going to 2H2O. To balance it out, we had a two in front of the H2. So this is that same reaction we looked at last time, two H2 molecules reacting with 1O2 to form two H2Os. That that's an example of a chemical reaction. We see the, 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 the formulas changing uh, throughout the course of that chemical reaction. A physical reaction might just be a phase change or something that doesn't actually allow the substance to change physical form or chemical form, that is. So if we take water in the form of ice and just melt it to water liquid, Sometimes you get a little confused that we can write this out as if it were a chemical reaction. You know, we can write it in the, the general form that you write for chemical reactions, but it's really just a physical reaction because we're not changing the composition of water, we're just changing the physical state. So this here would be a physical reaction. And even though we wrote it like a chemical reaction, it's technically not a chemical reaction. A chemical, chemical reaction would require a change in the, the form of those substances throughout the course of the reaction. We have to turn like water somehow into hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, somehow change the subscripts or the nature of the, the reactants and products. We talked a little bit about intensive versus extensive properties. These are whether or not the property is characteristic of the substance itself, like how different compounds tend to have different melting points and boiling points or densities. Those are a characteristic property that characterize the substance and are usually different for different substances. Those are what we call the intensive property. So an intensive property is a characteristic property. And it's characteristic of whatever the compound is. So an example would be like a melting point, a boiling point, a density. You know, these things where if you have water versus ethanol, they're going to have different melting points, different boiling points, different densities. An extensive property is just a quantity dependent property. So this one here depends on quantity. And so a quantity dependent, there's one obvious one, the qu a quantity dependent property of a substance is its mass. Like how much mass of a substance do you have? Well, it depends on how much of it you happen to have. You can have five grams of water or you can have 10 grams of water. Um, but no matter how much of that water you have, it still has the same boiling point. So the boiling point of water isn't changing with the mass of water, um, but the mass of water is obviously changing with the mass of water, that's an obvious one. The volume of water would be a quantity dependent. You could have 100 milliliters, you can have a liter of water. So volume would be a uh, quantity dependent property. The ratio of mass to volume though is a constant. A ratio of the mass to the volume, the density of the substance would be the intensive or characteristic property. I think the main reason we're pointing these out here in this chapter is just to point out that there's going to be properties of a substance that are specific to that substance. There are going to be other properties that are just specific to the quantity of the substance. So we just want to lay the groundwork for those terms here in chapter one. Um, this picture here is just kind of showing you a schematic of the difference between like an atomic sample, uh, perhaps box A is an example maybe of like a helium gas sample because we see a single atom um, interacting or moving around the box independent of each other. 
Uh, then the next example, we see molecules. We know these are molecules because we have two atoms bonded together. The same shading of the colors is indicating that they're the same element. Um, so both the atoms are the same element. Maybe this is something like N2 or O2 for an example, just to show you a sample of what nitrogen might look like. Um, the next one is showing us maybe what um, a molecular compound looks like um, within a sample. So maybe this is NH3 or something like ammonia, um, just to kind of pick up the ratio of what looks like three green spheres to a purple sphere. Um, so maybe this is something like ammonia. Um, we can pick out two elements just because of the shading of the colors being different. So one of the atoms being purple, the other being green is how I'm kind of picking out that there's um, two different elements present. So that's what makes this um, a compound. Um, and then the fact that the atoms are kind of sticking together and there's separate molecules in the samples, what makes this a molecular compound or a molecular sample. If we saw something, and this gets a little bit into something we'll see in chapter four, but if we see something like Na plus Cl minus, Na plus um, Cl minus, with this kind of representation here, maybe with a lot of spheres connected, this is what a solid sample of an ionic compound would tend to look like. And so this would be a representation of an ionic compound. Just to differentiate the thought of a molecular compound, individual molecules that aren't connected together, notice that there's no connection between the adjacent molecules. So if we had a sample of this NH3, we're just picturing you know, individual molecules you know, kind of bouncing around the container. And then the last example is just showing a mixture of um, all of those kind of three possibilities, or the three possibilities shown together in one container for some sort of a mixture. So here we have a mixture shown. We can have all kinds of mixtures. We'll talk about a couple types. But this is just um, an example of putting different substances together in a container and seeing that there can be mixtures. Okay, so this slide here isn't necessarily showing all the, all the types of compositions of matter, but just giving you a pictorial example of some of the examples of an atomic gas, molecular gas, uh, molecular compound, and a mixture of those. So states of matter, this, some of the parts in chapter one, this is what I'm talking about, where there's some parts you can come across and, and be like, okay, how much am I gonna read about there being a solid, liquid, and gas phase? We, we know this. But the, there's one important thing that I think is good just to make sure we're on the same page and we remember this, that when we go from water vapor to water liquid to ice, <clears throat> that we're not changing the composition of the water molecule. We're just changing the nature of how those molecules are being stuck together. Vapor phase, not at all. Liquid phase, the water molecules are adjacent but tumbling around each other. And then the ice phase, those water molecules are more stuck in space and then kind of frozen, if you will. But we're not changing the nature that we still have a water molecule in the ice sample that then frees itself and tumbles around in the liquid water and then can vaporize and be far away from the other molecules in the vapor uh, phase. That we still have two hydrogens to one oxygen. We're not breaking the bonds between hydrogen and oxygen within one molecule of water. <clears throat> We're breaking the attractive forces between adjacent water molecules as we go from, go from ice to liquid water to gas. So in ice, two adjacent water molecules stuck together or a bunch of water molecules stuck together, but still separate water molecules. Um, this doesn't go like Na plus minus plus minus. Ionic compounds have all these plus minus charges where all the plus and minuses are attracted together um, in an ionic bond. And water, two water molecules, they have like a hydrogen bonding force of attraction. We'll talk about that force a little more in chapter 11. You may have heard of this, but you have a force of attraction holding those water molecules together, not the same bonds that you have between the H, the O, and um, water. So these are covalent bonds. Talk about those more in chapter eight. I'm sure you've heard the word, but I'm just trying to make sure that we see that when you have another water, water molecule nearby, that this is not a covalent bond. This is that H bond. So when we melt water, we're breaking those hydrogen bonding, some of those hydrogen bonding forces of attraction. When we vaporize the sample, we're breaking all the other hydrogen bonding samples that are present between adjacent water molecules, but we're never breaking those covalent bonds. So you can freeze and melt water and you still have water molecules present before and after. So this chart here is just one that we can use to try to consider if a piece of matter is um, you know, try to figure out 
some questions we might try to address if we want to figure out if we have an elemental sample, if we have a molecular compound, if we have some kind of mixture. And some of these questions, and one of the things that's kind of confusing with this chart, some of these questions are hard to answer if you're just like looking, if you're looking at a substance and you see a clear liquid in a container, you will never know without knowing something about what's put in that container if that's a mixture or if it's pure water or what it happens to be. So some of the questions here, you have to know something about how a sample was made or something that might help you answer the question. Sometimes you can tell by looking though at a sample. Like if you're looking at like, you know, something really obvious like a, a, a jar of Italian dressing. You can physically see different pieces in the jar. You can sometimes see a layer in the top and a layer on the bottom. So the first question of addressing the piece of matter, is it uniform throughout? This question is usually something you can tell by looking at a piece of sample. You're just trying to address, when I look at it, does everything look the same or are there parts that look different from the other? So does it appear to be uniform or does it appear as if there's two layers, two sides? Uh, to the uh, substance. If there's two sides, if you can see it's not uniform, then you know you have some kind of mixture, and we would call that a heterogeneous mixture. So a heterogeneous mixture would be one where there's like two phases, one where you have like ice and water together would be heterogeneous, where you have um, clearly two different phases, if you will, of that substance. Um, so heterogeneous mixture, usually easy to tell by eyes if you have such a mixture. And then if you look at something that's like a clear liquid or it's a green liquid, but green all throughout. It looks the same. If you look at one part, another part of the solution, they look identical. Then you can say that the matter is homogenous. Now, just saying it's homogenous doesn't make it a homogenous uh, mixture. It just means it looks the same. So if the, if the sample looks the same, then we're trying to break apart and answer a question that allows us to figure out if we have a mixture or if we have a pure substance. Now, this question here, does it have a variable composition? This is where, unless you have like molecular goggles that you're wearing, you're not gonna answer this by usually looking at a sample. If you're looking at a clear liquid trying to go, is that poison or is that water? You're, you're probably not gonna go, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're not gonna know by looking. But if somebody told you, well, I put you know, these two things into that container and they mixed together and it became homogenous, you would probably say, oh, okay, well clearly that's a mixture because you just told me you put two different substances. Maybe I put table salt, and water together, wait for it to dissolve, I know I have two different substances present, then I would know that that solution happens to be a mixture. So if we know something that allows us to determine there's a variable composition, a variable composition would just mean I'm looking in the container and I can see or know that there's a water molecule present and then there's you know something else present, there's some other compound present. So the variable composition would be there's like an A and a B or, or C or other substances present, if we can identify the composition of different pieces, this is kind of um, just like knowing somehow that one molecule is one form, another molecule is a different form of a different compound, then we would have a mixture. And it's homogenous because it's mixed together equally. Um, it's homogenous because it's equally dispersed and not like in layers, um, like our heterogeneous mixture. And then if we know it doesn't have a variable composition, somehow we know every molecule in that sample you know, within 99% plus, nothing's ever 100% pure. But if we have a sample of quote unquote pure water, um, where it's mostly water molecules, then we have a pure substance. And so if we know the, the substance does not have a variable composition, meaning all the molecules are 99% plus the same molecule, we have a pure substance. And then the question becomes, and again, you're usually not gonna be able just to look at something and answer this question. Like you see a shiny metal, you won't know if it's silver or if it's some kind of alloy that contains two different elements. To answer the question, does it contain more than one kind of atom? You might have to do an experiment, you might have to get some information, but if you determine there to be uh, more than one kind of atom, more than one element, then obviously we have a compound. And if there's um, just one element present, then that's just the elemental sample. So if we have a liquid, um, it's brown, we know there's nothing else present, and then we do an experiment and find there's just one element present, then we're probably pretty sure that's liquid bromine. Liquid bromine happens to be red brownish in color. Um, so then you can imagine being handed another piece of sample and being told that yes, it's homogenous, you, it all looks the same, but there happens to be two different components when we did an experiment and we saw two components. So you can say, well, that's some kind of homogenous mixture. So this slide here, a little complicated, I think, because it, it gives you some questions that you can't really answer without information, but usually if you're given a question on this topic, you get some information to help answer those questions. Okay, so 
let's stop for a moment. This is a pretty, I think, straightforward question. I'd like to give some questions in class where you guys get a chance to kind of just try them on your own or work with your classmates for a couple minutes. It allows you to catch up with what we were just talking about. I'll do these, you know, couple problems usually uh, in lecture. So which term do you think best describes um, a sample of table sugar? So think about this one for a minute or two. And feel free to talk amongst yourselves if you want. So let's take a look at this one here. So now this question is kind of weird. I mean, it is asking, you know, saying which, which term does not best describe um, this um, sample. Now, one thing I was thinking, if I had a packet of table sugar, I think the heterogeneous mixture would probably apply because you'd have the paper and you have the sugar. That would be some sort of weird mixture. But we're just looking at the actual contents inside the packet. So we're just thinking of this sample of sugar. Um, what terms best describe that sample. I think the one that doesn't describe it would be heterogeneous, that when we look at a sample, we get individual specks of white powder that are all uniform. So the sample looks like a white powder, um, all looks the same throughout. So I think this sample, or this, this answer D is the one that's the right answer, the one that does not apply to the sample of sugar. Now let's think about the others. You might have to know a little bit about table sugar. Does anybody know what table sugar mostly is? So I think it's mostly sucrose um, is, is the main compound um, in sugar. So it does contain some sort of molecule. It might contain some glucose too, but I think probably mostly um, uh, sucrose. And so it does contain molecules. Um, those molecules are compounds because the, the sample of a sugar, like glucose is C6H12O6, and sucrose is C, you don't have to memorize these or anything, C12H22O11. Just kind of pointing out the formulas because you've probably seen these formulas before. Um, and then the sample, I think, would appear homogenous, that it would appear to be uniform throughout. Um, so I think all of these answers here would apply and therefore not be the answer to the question. So the, the, the term that does not apply to the sample of sugar would be answer D. Um, I think a asking questions as a teacher, which does not apply, is always tricky as a student because sometimes you go and, well, A sounds right, so you put answer A. Well, A is. <laughs> the true statement, but not for the question being asked. It is not the term that does not describe the sample. Um, so this one here, I think we'll just think of this one here together and not break into um, a little session to study it or to look at this one. And this one here is kind of an, an awkward trick, too, just to think about what actually is in a lead pencil. Um, in the, um, or, or so which substance below is best described as a pure element? And so one of the choices is the lead in a lead pencil. And now, the lead in a lead pencil isn't lead. Um, but does anybody know what actually is in a pencil? Yeah, graphite. And what is graphite? Do you, anybody know the element? Yeah, carbon. And so it actually is just carbon in graphite form. 
So the lead and the lead pencil is actually something you could best describe as being an element. Um, so I'm not sure we've ever thought of a pencil just being an elemental sample, um, but it is. It's just the graphite form of uh, carbon. Carbon's interesting in a lot of ways. Um, it has diamond as another one of its elemental forms, obviously much more precious, not gonna write as well with it. Um, and then it does have things like carbon nanotubes that it forms, it forms like buckyballs. You can make all kinds of things out of just carbon atoms. So carbon does have what we call allotropes. I think that's a word that we introduce at some point in the class, but an allotrope might be a different form, but of the same element. So these would be allotropes. Let me write that again. So allotropes are just different forms of the same element. Does anybody know an allotrope of oxygen? Ozone. So ozone would be an allotrope. So O3, um, three oxygens bonded together in one molecule, be a form of um, an allotrope of oxygen. Now, what are some things that aren't elements? Obviously, black coffee. Now, again, you don't have to know much about coffee to know that it has water and something else, and those are compounds. And so that's not going to be a pure element. The air you breathe um, does contain elements, just not a pure element. So air we breathe is, I'm sure you guys know, mostly nitrogen. Um, so it's about 78% N2, about 21% um, O2. You actually breathe in some element. Do you know what element you're breathing in? It's argon. So about 1% of air is argon. It is actually the next most abundant um, substance or uh, component of air is argon. Um, and so the rest is everything else, uh, water vapor. Um, in fact, there's less than 1% that would be water vapor, um, CO2, um, things of that nature. And so uh, air we breathe does contain some elements, but just not a pure element. Ice cube obviously is H2O, a compound. So going through this one here, um, just lead in that lead pencil, which is actually graphite, not lead. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some different separation techniques. And some of these are, um, there's three techniques we introduced. The first one is filtration. If you have a liquid and a solid together, obviously an easy way to separate is just with like filter paper. Um, a filtration is also an interesting separation technique. If you have like two different compounds in a solution that are dissolved in water, maybe you can add something that would cause one of them to form a solid, and then you can separate that component um, by filtering at that point. So filtration is a way we can separate mixtures um, based on just different phases. Distillation is another separation technique. This works well when you have two different volatile components um, that are in a liquid mixture together. Um, like ethanol and water is a good example. Um, they have a variable or a different boiling point, so they have different vapor compositions. Um, so um, it's actually the question's gonna ask this, but maybe we'll look at it together. But if you had water, in fact, let me, well, let, let, let me talk about the example that's on, on this actual page, and we'll talk about the ethanol water uh, distillation in a minute. But this um, example here has salt water. So NaCl, really high boiling. Um, salt um, doesn't have a large vapor composition above salt water. Um, so we can boil the sample that contains salt and water, and predominantly we're gonna get a higher concentration of water in the vapor, and then we can collect that higher concentration of water in a collecting flask, usually using something like a condenser to cool those vapors back down. Um, you might have to do this more than once, so you will get some of the NaCl that comes over with the water. But if you keep doing a distillation, you can purify a sample more and more. And it just really works on differences of vapor composition compared to the liquid phase composition. There's a really tricky problem that comes up in Chem 1220 where you can actually calculate using some equations what the vapor composition is compared to the liquid. And then you can imagine distilling that. And you can imagine taking that vapor composition, distilling it again, and kind of doing the calculations again and seeing each time you can get to a higher concentration of that more vaporous compound. So here we're told that um, a mixture is 15% by volume. That's about what you're gonna get to with um, uh, fermenting um, sort of grain or something like that. So you ferment something that makes alcohol, you get about 50% by volume ethanol. If you wanna make something like vodka or higher percentage alcohol, you're gonna have to distill that mixture to get to the higher alcohol contents. Notice the boiling point difference. 
of ethanol and water. And so which of the two do you think is going to be in higher composition of the vapor? The lower boiling or the higher boiling? So like if we're boiling this mixture, 15% ethanol, um, the 85% water, do you think we're gonna get more water in the vapor phase or more ethanol? We're gonna get more ethanol because it's lower boiling. So it's gonna have a higher vapor composition. So it's gonna be, have a higher composition in the vapor. Now the problem is it's never going to be 100% ethanol. So it's never gonna be the case where we get 100% ethanol um, in that vapor phase and 0% water. We're gonna get a higher concentration of ethanol than we do water, and then we might distill it again and again as many times as we need to, or you might just use a bigger distillation column. So the bigger the distillation column can help you get a greater purity, but you still never get to 100. Does anybody know what you can get to if you distill alcohol, what kind of the limit is? It's about 95%. So like you probably think of that if you've ever seen or heard of um, like Everclear or uh, Moonshine. Um, so with distillation, you're not gonna get to 100%. Um, so usually if you do get to 100%, they added a drying agent, and the drying agent you wouldn't wanna drink. So if you do ever see 100% ethanol, don't drink it. Um, it's usually not good. And also, this is a good thing to mention, since usually labs have alcohol in them, uh, solutions, a lot of times to buy cheaper alcohol, you, we buy denatured alcohol that you're, you can't drink. So don't drink alcohol you find in the lab. I don't know, um, just as a public service announcement. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what we're saying here is it's certainly not going to be pure water because water is going to be what's left behind in higher concentration. It's not going to be pure ethanol, but it's going to contain a greater concentration than 15% ethanol. We're gonna get a greater composition than what we start with in the case of ethanol when we go to distill this mixture. Okay. And so, and again, you can distill more than once if you need to to get to a higher concentration. Um, I'm not gonna introduce and write down the word because I don't want you to think you need to memorize it, but the word that you get is azeotrope. So once you get to the limit where you can't purify the mixture anymore, we call that the azeotrope. So an azeotrope is the point where the vapors have the same composition as the liquid. And so for ethanol, the max is about 95%. And I just bring that up because I think we may have seen that before. You may have known that already. Okay, so another way of separating mixtures, you do this a lot in, um, well, you get introduced to the idea, I don't know if you do it a lot in organic chemistry as a student, if you become an organic chemist, you do this probably every day or every other day to purify substances that you make, and it's a technique called column chromatography. But chromatography is a way to separate components, usually from a liquid sample, that you can load onto a column that has some sort of stationary phase. It might be hard to see that there's some sort of stationary phase. You can imagine that phase being like silica gel, like some sort of like powder, something like sand could technically work. Um, just something where you're imagining a solid support where a liquid sample can flow through it and different components in that mixture are going to stick to that solid phase and then fall at different rates. So you can imagine that the, so the stationary phase has like hands hanging on it and molecules can hang on with their hands to those um, supports and then other molecules don't have any hands to hang on to those pieces of the stationary phase and will go through the phase faster. And so the key would be, if substances travel through the stationary phase at different rates, then you can get a separation. Um, I think when you get introduced to this technique, I don't know if they still do it this way here, but the way we had done it when I was in grad school was you would use a component that has two different colors where you can physically see the colors separating um, on the column as they're separating. So you can physically see the separation of the substances as the, the sort of solvent phase is going through the stationary phase. Um, this has been observed by probably everybody in the room, though, when you use an ink pen that's usually black ink that has multiple dyes to make it appear that color, and then when you have water or something travel through the piece of paper, you've probably seen the blue and purple colors separate. Um, that is using paper as the stationary phase and water as the solvent, and the dyes are holding onto the water and traveling at different rates. And so we've all seen this with paper before with ink traveling at different rates through the piece of paper. And so this is just to kind of introduce three different ways we can separate mixtures of different types of substances. So filtration, distillation, and chromatography. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, energy. Chapter one is kind of an interesting chapter because it's throwing some terms at us. It's kind of getting us to think about some different types of samples, talking about how we might purify samples. 
And then we get into the second half of the chapter, which starts getting into some numerical type problems and just some units or some different types of like data analysis techniques that we're gonna need to use and apply throughout the course. And so the kind of middle topic in the chapter gets into energy. And then later in chapter five, we kind of come back to the topic of energy and talk about it in a lot more detail than we are here in chapter one. But um, I think this is a topic that you all have seen different topics of this in science throughout different levels of your uh, education. Um, also in physics class, if you've taken that, or a physical science, you may have come across this um, topic in that class as well. But energy is just the capacity to do work or transfer heat. And um, there's a lot of different ways that the energy can be transferred. There's a lot of ways the energy can be stored. You can think of electrical energy. You can think of batteries. You can think of um, all different kinds of ways to pass electrical energy. You can think of work as mechanical work, moving an object, um, and then heating something up. You can think about increasing its temperature. And so uh, work, then, is the energy transferred when a force is exerted on an object, um, causing the object to move, to displace the object. Um, now, this is a chemistry class, so we don't get a whole lot into the whole notion of putting like a car into motion through the combustion of gasoline, through the combustion of hydrocarbon reactions. We might talk about combustion reactions so we can write reactants and products, but we're not a mechanical engineering class, so we're not really focused too much on, on a mechanical engine that might be doing a lot of work to put an object into um, motion. Um, but what we do want to understand, though, is that it is... Um, like if you have a reaction that gives energy off and some of that is used for work, the remaining energy would be used to heat up the object. And so you can think of a uh, combustion reaction as it's taking place, the engine gets hot because that's the heat that's been given off from the reaction. That's not going into putting the object into motion. And so then heat is required, um, heat is the uh, energy required to cause an increase in temperature of an object. So if an object's going to increase its temperature, um, depending on the substance, a different amount of heat might be required to raise that object's uh, temperature. And so this is often, you know, you can think of a specific heat of a, of a substance being, you know, for maybe one type of substance lower and another substance being higher. A higher specific heat means it takes more heat to heat that object up. You might remember water specific heat. It's about four. 0.18 joules per gram Kelvin. Again, I'm not putting this here to memorize, just here to kind of think of an example. This is the specific heat of water. You may have seen it before. So if we're going to raise, um, and let me also change this unit here from Kelvin to degree C. Um, just degree C, probably more common temperature unit. To raise water's heat by one degree, so we're going to go from 25 to 26 degrees Celsius for a water sample, and we have one gram of water, it's going to take 4.18 joules. We're going to introduce the joules unit in a minute so we can understand that unit a little bit more in a moment, but this is the specific heat of water. So we can think of, about how much heat it would take to raise water's um, heat based off of this specific heat. We do more calculations with specific heat and relating that quantity to amounts of water later when we get to chapter five. Um, in this chapter, one of the things we want to also differentiate between is kinetic versus potential energy. Just the idea of receiving like kinetic energy to go into motion. We might think of kinetic energy being you know one half mv squared is our kinetic energy, and then potential energy is just the potential that we might have to release into kinetic energy. It's the top of the hill energy. There's a slide on the next page that might be more useful to look at potential energy. The potential, uh, potential energy is like being at the top of the mountain, having all that stored energy to use to go down the mountain. Now, what about chemicals? What about chemistry? How does this relate to chemistry? Well, in a way, um, we have potential energy in the form of hydrogen and oxygen because they can release energy. They're at the like, top of their potential energy hill. If they get that spark, and form water as a result of the chemical reaction that ensued, we then see that water molecules were at the bottom of the hill, H2O2 were like at the top of the hill. And that energy difference was given off in the form of that kaboom that we saw, the flame that, that produced, uh, um, that, that resulted from the balloon exploding. And so H2O2 is kind of the same idea, that we had stored energy in the form of potential energy. Now, how did we store the energy? Well, somehow we had to take uh, usually water is one of those ways you can get hydrogen is you um, electrolyze water to get hydrogen. So you put energy into water to get the hydrogen. 
And then when you form water again, you get that energy back out. And so hydrogen itself is often described as being an energy storage source. You can store energy in the form of hydrogen, because you can then later release it to form water through reactions like we saw that combustion reaction. Now, much better to be an electrical engineer. Who's an electrical engineer in the room? There's probably a few. No electrical engineers? OK. That's, oh, there was one hand, <laughs> at least. Um, now, an electrical engineer is probably going to say, well, what if we take this reaction and instead of having it go kaboom, we have electricity? <laughs> much better way um, so that we're not exploding our car and using that electrical energy to do work as well. So that's a topic for electrical engineering classes. So, but it's the same concept, the same concept of having stored energy in the form of hydrogen being released into some form of kinetic energy. And so I just want to make sure we draw this analogy, that you can think of reactions releasing energy just like you can think of a bicyclist at the top of the hill releasing energy by going down. Now, the bicyclist can sit at the top of the hill forever if, if, if he or she wants. But then the moment they peter over the edge and start going down, the top breaks, they're going nonstop. Same thing with, the, with some chemical reactions. They're at the ledge, H2O2 are at the ledge of reacting, but they're not going to react until we give them that spark. We give them the spark, kaboom, the reaction goes very quickly. OK, so now one kind of unit to introduce here in this section is the joule. Um, and so the joule is the SI unit of uh, energy. In the next section of the textbook, they introduce SI units. So kind of to come in a moment are the base SI units. But um, the joule is the um, SI unit of energy. And so we mentioned um, on the last slide, it's 1 half mv squared. I think we've probably seen this equation before for calculating kinetic energy. And um, the um, unit, so I don't, this is a silly typo that I've had for a while that I keep forgetting the change. It is 1 um, joule is 1 kilogram meter squared per second squared, not a half. Um, I just had mistakenly put the half from the kinetic energy equation in. So one joule, let me rewrite this, one joule is equal to one kilogram meter squared per second squared. And then you can rewrite that as one kilogram meter per second squared with the meter per second just being together in a parentheses. And so the, uh, we'll see soon that the SI unit of mass is the kilogram. That's probably the only kind of trick question. If we said for the base SI units, what's the SI unit of mass? It turns out to be the kilogram, not the gram. And then every other base SI unit doesn't have like one of those kilo or milli prefixes. So the SI unit of length is the meter. And then the SI unit of time is the second. So mass is the weird one that they throw the base SI unit as being the kilogram and not just the, the gram itself. So one joule is one kilogram meter squared per second squared. Now we're given this problem here. We'll work this out together just to kind of see how we might calculate um, a kinetic energy for um, some sort of gas sample. So we're told we have a mole of oxygen, um, 32.00 grams. We'll talk about molar masses and things like that when we get into chapters two and three later. But we're given this much mass of oxygen. We're told that that's a mole. Um, it's uh, in a container at room temperature. And then the average kinetic energy of the particles is 1,080 miles per hour. What is the kinetic energy of the particles in kilojoules? OK, so let's think about this, uh, how we might take our kinetic energy equation. So we know the mass of the water molecules is 32.00 grams. And then I'm going to leave a little space, and then we know that the velocity here would be 1,080, but it's miles per hour. And that we need to square this, because that's the velocity. But notice that this isn't really in a common unit that's going to allow us to transfer or convert the units from kilogram meter squared per second squared over to the joule. So what we ideally are going to need to do, if we want to convert kilogram meter squared per second squared to joule, we'd probably want to convert gram to kilogram. Now, in a couple of sections, we do introduce some prefixes, if you haven't seen all of them, uh, and the ones that, that we're going to need to know for this class. But I think we probably know the kilogram. And remember that 1,000 grams are in a kilogram. And that we can do that conversion into kilograms. So we might do that conversion here for converting our mass into uh, kilograms. And then the mile per hour conversion 
Maybe we'll just do that separately. So let's try to convert that into meter per second. So let's try to ask the question here, how many meters per second are there in 1,080 miles per hour? Now, this is introducing dimensional analysis. That's kind of the last section in chapter uh, one is using dimensional analysis. Now, there are, well, the simplest way to do this, right, is just to go, and this is how 10,080 miles per hour, or MPH, equals meters per second in Google, and it'll just tell you, right? That's probably how, if we were doing this on a homework problem, we would probably do it. But to do it with dimensional analysis is almost as easy. It just takes a couple of steps. And I will give a caveat that if you need to do this kind of conversion on a test, I recognize that you know, we have a, a lot of students who aren't domestic US students who don't use miles and feet that often. We would always give conversion factors for this problem. And so let's even imagine that we'll write in, that we'll have givens down here so that you know that you would be given this information if you need to use it. You'd be given one mile is 5,280 feet. So you're not gonna have to have that memorized to solve a problem like this, so one mile. It's 5,280 feet. And then we're just canceling out that unit. Uh, there's more than one way to write out dimensional analysis. Sometimes, you know, students write out something that kind of looks like this, and that's fine. I mean, however you know to solve dimensional analysis, but we're just trying to use equalities that one mile is equal to 5,280 feet. That's why this cancels out this way. And if we're trying to go to meters um, from feet, usually the centimeter is the conversion that's given. So usually you're given one centimeter is 2.54 inches, or um, the other way around. One inch is 2.54 centimeters. You often see this, we'll talk about this next time, but the exact, you often get told that there's exactly 2.54 centimeters in an inch. That's an exact defined conversion factor. Now we'd also have to know that there's 12, in, uh, 12 inches in a foot. And again, if you're not from the US, probably never even encountered this unit before. Um, so one foot is 12 inches. So one inch, 2.54 centimeters. And then um, we can go to meters. So 100 centimeters. That's usually not a given, but we will also introduce the conversion factors that you have to know uh, in, in a couple of slides. And so that meter to centimeter conversion is one that if you didn't know that one already, we'll review it and you'll see it and come across it a couple times and just know that one hopefully by heart for exams. So these are the conversions that you would generally be given here. And the hour to seconds um, is, is doing one hour to 3,600 seconds. Is that good? Um, so we can say one hour, but on top is 60 minutes, 60 minutes, 60 seconds each. So 3,600 seconds. Has anybody just thrown that into Google yet? <laughs> if somebody wants to, feel free, because we'll, we'll compare. So I get four 183 meters per second, is that what, I'm sure that's what Google says. Now, rounding and sig figs is a topic for discussion. It's probably not a topic for five minutes of discussion, but where we round values to is gonna lead us to the topic of significant figures. And one thing I think it's worth mentioning right now is if you've seen multiplication rule and you recall it, does anybody recall the multiplication rule? How we count sig figs and we round to the least number of sig figs? This problem, oftentimes I've had this as a question. If you just do this conversion, what, how many digits should you round the value to? And sometimes people think it's two because of this here. They think 12 inches has two sig figs, we're gonna round this to two. I often then say, well, why don't you round it to one sig fig because of the one? You have to be careful when you do exact conversions. So these conversion factors are all exact. Um, I mean, so these conversion factors aren't things that we look at to round values off of. If you're rounding a value because of your conversion factor, either A, look up a more precise conversion factor, 
or B, you're doing really, really precise work. Um, so usually a conversion factor is going to be much more known to greater um, um, digits of preciseness than anything that you're rounding. So, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along into that topic of sig figs. So we're just going to put this 483 over here, and then we can square it for the, the meters per second. So let's try to finish this problem off. I'm going to erase this here and then write in 483 meters per second. And we're close to getting the energy in joules. So when we calculate 1 half times 32 times 483 squared, that that comes out to be like 3.73 million. It's 3. So this result here. 373, I'm just going to write the whole thing down and see my calculator. It's that number of kilogram meter squared per second squared. But remember how we introduced that this unit is the joule. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. I did forget to convert to kilograms. So divide by 1,000. Yeah, that would make this number make more sense, too. Yeah, good catch. Thank you. So I use the 32 grams. So 0.5 times 32 divide by 1,000 times 483 squared leads it to a much more normal number. Yeah, thanks. So that's 3,700. And 32 kilogram meter squared per second squared. Now the key is that all of this here is the joule. So what that is, that's just that's just a joule. So it's 3,732 joules, and then it wanted the answer in kilojoules, thousand joules per kilojoules, right? So if I just take this number of joules here. 3.73 kilojoules. Now, we do need to talk about sig figs and why I might round that to, to three placeholders, but that's going to be one of our next topics of discussion, is like how we know where to round values off to. Let me just